There are 31 pairs of spinal nerves that supply all parts of the body except the head and neck. All of the spinal nerves are mixed nerves and they're named for the location they emerge from the spinal cord. The cervical nerves emerge from the cervical region of the spinal cord. There are eight pair and they are named C1 through C8. There are 12 pair of thoracic nerves, five pair of lumbar nerves, five pair of sacral nerves, and one coccygeal nerve pair. The spinal nerves are attached to the spinal cord by their roots. The ventral root carries motor information away from the central nervous system, and the dorsal root carries sensory information to the central nervous system. The sensory nerve cell bodies are located in the dorsal root ganglia, which is found on the dorsal root. The roots merge to form the spinal nerves, so all spinal nerves are mixed, both sensory and motor fibers. They leave the vertebral column through the intervertebral foramina, those holes between the vertebra. The dorsal root with its rootlets, and there's the dorsal root ganglia, and here is the ventral root with its rootlets. They're going to merge to make the spinal nerve, and that will go through the intervertebral foramina. The spinal nerves are relatively short. Once they go through the intervertebral foramina, they immediately divide. The dorsal rami are going to go to the dorsal body surface. The meningeal branch will fold back and go back to the meninges. The rami communicantes, or the white rami, is part of the autonomic nervous system, and the ventral rami will go to the ventral surface of the body. In the thoracic region, the thoracic ventral rami go along the intercostal muscles. The other rami form plexuses to serve the limbs. This is through the thoracic area. There we see the dorsal and ventral roots merging to make the spinal nerve. There's the dorsal root ganglia. And as soon as the nerve goes through the intervertebral foramen, we have it branching immediately. The dorsal ramus will take sensory neurons and motor neurons to the back so that we can pick up sensory information as well as control the muscles of the back. The meningeal branch is not shown here, but it folds back, goes through the intervertebral foramen, and comes back to innervate the meninges around the spinal cord. The rami communicantes is going to go to the autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic chain, and here we see the ventral ramus. This comes out along the intercostal muscle, so it will control that muscle with the motor fibers, and the sensory fibers will pick up sensation from the parts of the skin that are on the ventral surface. Here again, you see the spinal nerve branching. This will be the dorsal ramus. This will be the ventral ramus. And here is that rami communicantes or white ramus. The nerves of the white ramus go to the autonomic nervous system. Those ganglia are here along the sides of the spinal cord in the sympathetic chain. Nerve plexuses are simply an interweaving of nerves. With the exception of the thoracic nerves, all of the other spinal nerves branch and join and mix with each other. As they mix their fibers, they make new nerves. This interweaving of nerve fibers makes up the plexuses. Each nerve that emerges from a plexus will have branches from several of the spinal nerves. This is protective because if one spinal nerve is damaged, the big nerve out here on the other side of the plexus will still have fibers that function from some of the other nerves. Plexuses are not formed by the thoracic spinal nerves. We do have a cervical plexus near the neck, a brachial plexus near the arm, the lumbar and sacral plexuses are in the lower back. The cervical plexus is made up of nerves from C1 through C5. Mostly these are cutaneous nerves that go to the skin of the neck, ear, back of the head, and shoulder. The phrenic nerve, which is composed of fibers from C3 through C5, supplies motor and sensory nerves to the diaphragm. The diaphragm is important for breathing movements. If this nerve is irritated, it can cause spasms of the diaphragm. That's what hiccups are. Damage to this nerve will paralyze the diaphragm and the person will be unable to breathe. They will be dependent on some sort of machine respirator. The brachial plexus is made up of fibers from C5 through C8 and T1. These nerves innervate the upper limbs. This is one of the most complicated structures in the body, and it's also the most frequently injured. Severe injuries will result in weakness or paralysis of the entire upper arm. How does this thing get damaged? Well, football tacklers yank the arms of the running back or a biker flips over the handlebars and their shoulder grinds into the ground. Anything that tries to pull the head further away from the shoulder tends to damage the brachial plexus. The nerves of the brachial plexus include the axillary nerve, which go to the deltoid muscle. The musculocutaneous nerve goes to the flexors on the arm. 
The median nerve goes to the wrist, the fingers, and the thumb. This is important in your pincher movement with the thumb and fingers, and if this nerve is entrapped, you get carpal tunnel syndrome. In this condition, the hand gets numb and the fingers don't move well. This nerve is frequently injured when people try to slash their wrist. The ulnar nerve is involved in finger and wrist extension. This nerve is very close to the surface at the olecranon process. If you bump your olecranon process, you'll get a tingling in the palm of your hand, but severe damage can cause the fingers to draw and you have some Thing called claw hand. The radial nerve takes care of the extensors of the arm. If this nerve is damaged, you have wrist drop. You can't straighten out your hand. You can get this through the improper use of crutches. The lumbar plexus is composed of nerves that emerge from L1 through L4. This plexus innervates the thigh muscles and a few muscles of the abdominal wall. The femoral nerve is in this plexus and innervates the quadriceps. The obturator nerve goes to the adductor muscles on the inner thigh. Herniated discs can compress these nerves, causing problems with walking. We sometimes refer to the lumbosacral plexus. Parts of the lumbar plexus overlap with parts of the sacral plexus, and sometimes they look like one big interweaving of fibers. The sacral plexus arises from L4 to S4. This is going to serve the buttock, the lower limb, the pelvic structures, and the perineum. The sciatic nerve is an important nerve that comes out of the sacral plexus. This is the longest and thickest nerve in the body. It comes out of the sacral region, goes all the way down the back of the leg, across the bottom of the foot to your big toe. This innervates the hamstring muscles, the adductor magnus, and most of the muscles in the leg and the foot. If this nerve is cut, we have transection of the sciatic nerve, then you have foot drop. Now this is important in walking. When you walk, you need to be able to lift your toes back up so you can put your heel down. With foot drop, you tend to trip over your toes. Sciatica is when this nerve is inflamed. Here you can have stabbing pain that runs down the back of your leg. At about the knee, this separates into two nerves, the tibial and the common fibular. The gluteal nerve innervates the gluteal muscles and the tensor fascia. The pudendal nerve innervates the perineum. This nerve must be intact for males to get an erection. The spinal nerves also innervate the skin, and we can sort of tell where the spinal nerves go because of dermatomes. A dermatome is simply an area of skin that's innervated by cutaneous branches of a single spinal nerve. All spinal nerves except C1 participate in dermatomes. The extent of a spinal cord injury can be determined by determining which dermatomes are affected. Most of the dermatomes overlap, so destruction of a single spinal nerve will not cause complete numbness in one of the dermatome areas. In this anterior view and this posterior view, you can see how the nerves come off and go down and innervate the skin. So these will pick up the cutaneous receptors. They go pretty much as you would expect. Here you can see the sacral plexus takes care of most of the back side of the body. And this was where the sciatic nerve was. The sciatic nerve also runs in this general area. Joints are innervated by something called Hilton's Law. Any nerve that serves a muscle that causes movement at a joint also innervates the joint and the skin over the joint. Motor endings are the peripheral nervous system element that activates the effector organs. This is what is going to release the neurotransmitter. The axon terminals of a somatic fiber compose the neuromuscular junction. They have tree-like branches that go to individual cells of the skeletal muscle. Acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter that is released and it excites the skeletal muscle. In the autonomic system, the autonomic fibers have varicosities. These are a series of swellings on the axonal endings, sort of like a string of beads. The varicosities release either acetylcholine or norepinephrine as a neurotransmitter. Autonomic fibers go to visceral muscle and the glands. This is a neuromuscular junction with the axon terminal coming in close communication with the skeletal muscle. Acetylcholine will come across the synapse activating the muscle. And this is smooth muscle. Here you see the swelling, the varicosities that contain the neurotransmitter. And these neurotransmitters will either excite or inhibit smooth muscle activity. The cerebral cortex is the highest level of conscious motor pathways. The cerebellum and the basal nuclei, however, are the ultimate party planners. They coordinate all of the complex motor activities. The cerebral cortex gets the idea to walk over and pick something up. The cerebellum and basal nuclei make sure that each muscle contracts exactly when it needs to so you get a nice, smooth, coordinated action. Reflex arcs can exert control on lower levels. 
Complex motor behavior depends on complex patterns of control. We have the segmental level, the projection level, and the pre-command level. The segmental level is the lowest level of motor control. This involves spinal cord circuits and includes reflexes and automatic movements. Central pattern generators are part of segmental circuits that activate networks of ventral horn neurons to stimulate specific groups of muscles. Central pattern generators help control locomotion and specific oft-repeated motor activity. Once you start walking, you sort of automatically walk. This is what a central pattern generator will do. The projection level of motor control consists of two things. First, we have the upper motor neurons. These are the ones that initiate the voluntary system. They cross in the pyramids of the medulla. They go down the spinal cord to connect with the lower motor neurons. This controls voluntary skeletal muscle movements. We also have the brainstem motor areas. These oversee the indirect system, what's called the extrapyramidal neurons. These neurons do not cross in the pyramids and tend to have a more complex route for getting where they're going. These control reflexes and those central pattern generators. Projection motor pathways send information to the lower motor neurons. They also help keep the higher command levels informed of what is happening. The pre-command level of motor functioning are the neurons in the cerebellum and the basal nuclei. These regulate motor activity. They assist with precisely starting or stopping movements and help coordinate movements with posture. They block unwanted movements when the muscle contracts so that we have a nice, smooth, controlled muscle contraction. They monitor muscle tone and they plan movements for the conscious brain to initiate. Sensory input feeds into the spinal cord at the segmental level and into the projection level here at the motor cortex. It would appear that the projection level, the motor cortex, would be in charge, but we also have some unperceived signals that go to the cerebellum and the basal nuclei. The cerebellum and basal nuclei plan the activities. They make sure that all of the muscles that need to contract as a result of this decision that's made at the projection level contract in just the right order at just the right time. The projection level is what sends to the segmental level, and this is what is going to give us our motor output. Now at the very lowest level, we have reflex activity. Sensory input to the spinal cord is automatically linked to a predetermined motor output. In the brain, the segmental level is located in the spinal cord, the projection level is your primary motor cortex, and the pre-command level is the cerebellum and the basal nuclei. While the projection level gets the idea to move, it is the cerebellum and the basal nuclei that actually plan the event so that the exact sequence of neurons are stimulated to provide a smooth muscle contraction. Reflexes are simply rapid, predictable, involuntary movements. They are in response to stimuli and they help us maintain homeostasis. Inborn reflexes are regulated by the brainstem and the spinal cord. Suckling and withdrawing from pain you come born with. Learned reflexes are acquired. They have repetition involved. Things like riding a bike or driving a car. Reflex arcs have five pieces to them. A receptor, a sensory neuron, an integration center, a motor neuron, and an effector. Somatic reflexes activate skeletal muscle. Autonomic reflexes activate visceral effectors. This would be heart muscle, smooth muscle, and glands. A stimulus is received by a receptor. A sensory neuron carries it into the spinal cord. In the integration center, we already have a pre-planned pathway that this information is going to take. This is an interneuron. The motor neuron will take the information to the effector and we will get the predictable planned activity. In this case, a sharp stimulus would cause you to withdraw from that stimulus. Testing somatic reflexes is important clinically so we can assess the condition of the nervous system. If reflexes are exaggerated, distorted, or absent, this can indicate degeneration or pathology of specific nervous system regions. Stretch reflexes cause muscles to contract if the muscle is stretched too far. This keeps us from overstretching a muscle. Stretch reflexes are important in maintaining posture and muscle tone. The patellar reflex or the knee jerk reflex is a stretch reflex. It is monosynaptic, there is only a single synapse, and it's ipsilateral. Ipsilateral means that the motor activity is on the same side of the body as the initial stimulus. This reflex checks to make sure that sensory motor connections are intact.
When you hit the patellar tendon with a reflex hammer, that's going to overstretch the muscle. That will send that sensory information into the spinal cord. The quadriceps extensors will be activated. There will be an immediate synapse with a motor neuron back to the quadriceps, causing you to kick your foot out. A positive reaction for this reflex indicates that sensory and motor connections between muscle and spinal cord are intact. The strength of the response indicates the degree of spinal cord excitability. The reflex is hypoactive or absent if peripheral nerve damage or ventral horn injury has occurred. It's hyperactive if there are lesions in the corticospinal tract, that is, problems in the spinal cord. Deep tendon reflexes are the reverse of stretch reflexes. They cause muscles to relax when they have been stretched. These reflexes are polysynaptic. There is at least one interneuron connecting the sensory and the motor neurons in this synapse. Pressure points are an example of a deep tendon reflex. If you apply deep pressure to a point, it hurts. It causes the muscle to relax so that there is no pain as a result of that deep pressure. The flexor or withdrawal reflex is when you pull away from a painful stimulus. If you prick your finger, you pull away from that. You can override this reflex if you tense the muscles. So when you know you're about to get a finger stick, you sort of tense your muscles up and that way you don't withdraw. This is an ipsilateral reflex, that is the motor activity occurs on the same side as the stimulus and it's polysynaptic. There's at least one interneuron involved here. The crossed extensor reflex is a balancing reflex. When you withdraw, you extend on the other side. The withdrawal part of this reflex is ipsilateral. The extensor reflex is contralateral. If you step on a toy in the middle of the night, you pull your foot back. That's a withdrawal reflex. You simultaneously extend the muscles on the opposite leg so that you support the sudden shift in weight. That's the extensor reflex. Superficial reflexes are excited by gentle cutaneous stimulation, light strokes on the skin. This depends on upper motor pathways and cord level reflex arcs. The two best known are the plantar reflex and the abdominal reflex. The plantar reflex, or the Babinski reflex, involves the integrity of L4 through S2. If you stroke the lateral aspect of the sole of the foot, sort of from the big toe down the lateral side, you should get a downward curling or flexion of the toes. That's the normal response. A Babinski sign occurs if the toes spread. Now this can be seen in infants because it takes one to one and a half years for the nerves to myelinate. Until those nerves are fully myelinated, you can't trust this response. The primary motor cortex or the corticospinal tracts are damaged if you get a positive Babinski sign. The abdominal reflexes check the integrity of T8 through T12. If you stroke the skin of the lateral abdomen, the umbilicus will move toward the stroke. This reflex is absent if there are corticospinal lesions. As we get older, the sensory receptors atrophy. There's less sensitivity, so we don't respond well to stimuli. The muscle tone in the face and neck become reduced. Wrinkling and that saggy neck thing happens. Reflexes tend to slow. This is why older people may stop driving. They just don't slam on the brake quite as fast as they used to. These changes are believed to be due to a loss of neurons, fewer synapses in the nervous system, and slower central processing.